Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. And hey, beautiful people, today I am speaking with Maria Wheatley. We're going to be talking about many sumptuous subjects that I'm excited about, including the secret history of Stonehenge and divining or divining earth energies. I want to tell you that I've got a book writing challenge coming up. If you'd like to finish your book, start your book anywhere in the process, but you're ready to complete your book this year, join it's a debbyd.net slash book challenge, D-E-B-B-I D dot net slash book challenge. It'll also be in the show notes. Dare to Dream won three Talk Radio Positive Change Awards, won the COVR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show, Wolp Magazine named Dare to Dream in the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year, and it's high ranking in Apple Podcasts under self-improvement. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness, and they do great energy work out into the world. You can find out more by going to drdanehere.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a book writing coach. I also take books to a guaranteed international bestselling status. And finally, I do some publicity work, getting people booked, especially spiritual messengers, getting them booked on podcasts and getting them more visibility. So again, if you're ready to write your book, complete your book, go to debbyd.net slash book challenge. Just spell my first name correctly, D-E-B-B-I-D.net slash book challenge. Well, I'm excited to interview this woman because we are both speaking in Glastonbury, UK this year in September. It already portends to be an amazing event. No kidding, folks. So we'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end of the show and also give out the link. So my guest today, Maria Wheatley, is a second generation dowser who is taught by European master dowsers, her late father, and Chinese geomats. Maria is the UK's leading authority on earth energies and ley lines that were skillfully incorporated into megalithic sites. Maria runs tours to sacred sites worldwide to experience Gaia's numerous energies. Maria is an accomplished author with many books and a new one coming out on sacred sites, dowsing, and past life astrology. Wow. If you'd like to find out more about her, you can go to esotericcollege.com and theaveryexperience.co.uk. And again, Maria and I and other notable speakers are speaking in September at the Portal to Ascension Glastonbury UK Conference. Tickets will be on sale. I definitely suggest you get them before it sells out, and that will be in the show notes. And with that, I bring the esteemable Maria Wheatley to Dare to Dream. Welcome. It is so great to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's great. You know, the more I deep dive during my research about you, I was like, wow, I am so impressed by you. I love that you were born into this, that it's in your lineage. And I really love, I know you're, it is a late father. Your father has passed. He must be so proud of you and where you've taken all of this work and how expansive it is. So kudos. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it's been a wonderful journey because- I started off, you know, dousing ancient sites for their earth energies. And I'm so, so fortunate because my late father was given numerous different documents, earth energy surveys, information about from other master dowsers going back to 1899. So in my legacy archive, I can go to any site that master dowsers have really looked into for many, many decades. And in that journey, I've made my own discoveries about different types of earth energies I'll talk with you about. But one of the really acclaimed finds of mine and it was really connected me to the past was discovering the long skulled people of Stonehenge and a Neolithic queen and so this connection to the ancient past was a feminine one mm -hmm. and one that took me back 
five and a half thousand years to time past. Love it. We're going to deep dive into all of that. And just for folks who may not know, Maria, what is dousing? What is it and how do you douse? <laughs> dousing is an extension of your sixth sense in some regard. And really it's about using copper rods or your hands or some people their, their feet or a pendulum, for example, and learning to understand the energies that Gaia emits. Mm. Because Gaia, Mother Earth, she emits certain energy patterns that the ancients were looking for, as spiral patterns, concentric circles, ley lines, earth currents. They all have their own identity and pattern. And Dowsin can tell us where they are and it can encode the land and decode the land allowing us to see where we should place maybe even our own homes our bed for example our office area so we can learn from the ancient past and apply that to a modern generation amazing you know another thing that you talk about is astrology However, it's use. You have many expertise. And we're not going to do this one big time today, but I just had to ask you, astrology and connection to past lives. That's something I've never heard of before. Can you talk about how you use astrology to access, heal, have people look at anything that's significant from a past life with the life they're leading right now? Oh, absolutely. It started off mainly because when I take people from all over the world to ancient sites from Egypt to Malta to Stonehenge and Glastonbury, past lives play a prominent role in that. And then one day I was on top of an ancient site quite close to Stonehenge, but where you're on elevated ground it felt the heavens were coming close to me and suddenly I got a download from a from a druid and saw this pattern of astrology before me at that time I happened to be the guide of the famous and late and great Dolores Cannon so Dolores Cannon said to me oh I'll test this system out let's see if it works so now, big bar to fill there. I thought, you know, oh, my gosh. But it came forth. And Dolores, God love her, published that book through the Ozark Mountain Publishing Company. And it's been in publication for quite a few years now. And loads of people have learned that system. Basically, it's applying your natal chart, your birth chart, your horoscope, and changes it to the symbol of the heart chakra. This is where our ancient sites, our ancient sites and our ancient past lives reside almost. And then any planets that fall into the heart chakra symbol are relevant to this incarnation. They're not all of your past lives because we could go on forever and a day, but they're the ones that have the most importance in this incarnation. So yes, so I have a fascination with past lives, ancient sites, and I think they're interwoven. Yes, I agree with you. I think they all have a tremendous influence on one another. And especially when you consider they're all concurrently going on at the same time, really, since there is no time. It's very powerful indeed to think that if you had patterns from one life, how it could influence you now. And also my understanding, especially once I got into galactic lineage readings for myself and started to see, oh, I've been doing sound and frequency healing in all of my lives, just about. I've been doing communication, whether it's singing or using my voice in some way with mass communication. Like these have been patterns in my life. It mm -hmm. so makes sense that I would be here doing this and so much more. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I call that the spiritual heritage that you've, uh, you know, you've grown into and uh, continue. So that that part of it is a wonder. It's a wonder. Yeah. And the other thing, and I've loved researching you because then I began learning more and more about the things you do. Talk about ley lines and talk about the earth energies and how those are integrated into ancient sites. Absolutely. For example, ley lines are commonly known by most people. They're a straight line that links ancient site after ancient site. That's one type of uh, ley line and very common throughout the ancient world and across the planet. 
But a really powerful major ley line is a straight line that has two earth currents entwining it. One is male and one is female. And these were discovered and rediscovered, actually, in about the 1980s by Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst. Uh, Hamish forwarded my book. He was a part of my legacy dowsing uh, as well. But uh, that was documented four and a half thousand years ago by the ancient Chinese. So they knew it's not just a ley line, it's the earth currents that entwine it. That's the power in the land. And that's what the ancients were looking for. They were looking for the crossing point of all three sometimes, the ley and the female current and the masculine current. For example, when we're in Glastonbury, there we are on the St. Michael ley line, very well documented ever since the 1960s by the author John Michel. And Mary and Michael Earth Currents entwine that and they grace the tour. Glastonbury Tour is a huge hill sculptured by ancient man that rises out of the very flat landscape. And that's where all three are the St. Michael line, the Michael Earth Current, and the Mary Earth Current. Why were they called Michael and Mary? What Hamish discovered on his odyssey was that church after church dedicated to Mary Magdalene, the Virgin Mary, Mother Mary, they were all sighted on that Earth Current. And join the dots now, on the Michael Earth Current, there was churches dedicated to either St. George, but prominently St. Michael. And now we've discovered more and more and more of these Earth Currents systems. I myself in ancient Egypt, dowsing the Nile temples, discovered a huge solar line that I called a Ra line and entwining that with three earth currents. And they were targeting at Abydos the chapels of Isis, Osiris, and Horus. And so I called them those names, just uh, as it's a kind of what was being done ever since the 1980s. So when we think about lays, we need to think and expand our knowledge and think about lay systems. They are always going to be found where ancient sites are sited. The other type of spectacular earth energy is born of very very deep water, what I call yin water. Imagine that we have two types of water, the water that's falling from the sky, yang water that fills up the aquifers and the underground streams, and that's where we get wells and water from. But there's another more sacred type of water, and that's born within the womb of Gaia, yin water. And where that water is, it emits a spiral pattern of energy called a geospiral. The ancients, in their wisdom, in their sensitivity, would place the central feature of, it could be at Stonehenge, the altar stone, the holiest of holies in the center would be the geospiral energy pattern. And now it's been discovered that beneath Stonehenge, the pyramids, whether they're in Mexico, Egypt, are these very, very deep aquifers. That's one of the strongest forms of feminine energy that the earth emits. And even today, Masons, secret societies and past the Templars, they would look for that. And that's why in England, the stately homes of the gentry, of the nobility, of queens and kings, they're always centered their house in the center of their land. It's the esoteric center. It's the heart of the land where the genie and the soul resides. And so that's why stately homes are always in the middle of a massive landscape. People can just think of Downton Abbey, right? If if that's their exactly. only reference, if they haven't been, because I have been to the countryside of, of England, my God, it's breathtaking. And that's exactly what you see is this home mm. surrounded by this massive amount of land and sometimes, you know, not very big, but hills and valleys. I mean, it's spectacular. Mm. And that's what they did. You have to tap into the heart. And, and the geospiral energy pattern is very, very powerful. Surface water, just uh, uh, if it's underground and it's kind of going to be rising to the surface, that emits just three lines of energy like that, like the sign of Aquarius 
in the heavens above. As an esoteric water diviner, I instantly know that's yang water. That three lines like that gives off geopathic stress. Not good to live above. The ancients were wise. They would never place their houses above that. They would place it above more positive earth energies, for example. So we can decode the land. We can say this is the heart of the land. This is where it's good to live. This is where you should avoid for instance. So there's lots of different things we can explore with the ancient art of dowsing and looking to ancient sites like Stonehenge because they are transformative. They are alchemic because they've got far more different energies therein. And that's been part of my legacy to look into the ancient sites across the world and to decode the land upon which they are sited. Yeah. You know, there are certain people who talk about healing the earth grid lines. And I know people travel the world doing this, some who do it remotely. Are ley lines and grid lines at all similar or completely mm. different? They are completely different. For, for example, the grid systems are born out of the five Plutonian solids. For example, you get the tetrahedron, the cube, for example, to name but two. And they have what's called sacred mathematics, pi. I mean, it's what we don't kind of go, ah, it's pi. We think about school. But basically, these five Plutonian solids, they all fit together. So you could fit them and they would create one. Now, what you can do with some grid systems is it's called vectoring. You could put in Stonehenge and the Great Pyramid as two points and then put in the tetrahedron system of a grid system. And it would link all ancient sites together across the world. They're grid systems. But mm -hmm. to the ancient geomancers, energy travels too fast along a straight line. It travels the line of least resistance. You need an earth current. That's the power in the land. That's far more gentle. So what did the ancient Chinese Feng Shui masters do? They avoided the straight lines. Oh, okay. And that's why all of their roofs are bowed. It allows qi to flow and not go in a straight line. So our roofs uh, in England, a lot of modern roofs, are very straight and linear. Chi travels too, too fast. So we try to look for the earth currents. Again, I think it's about educating different countries into looking beyond the straight line, looking mm -hmm. into the heart of the land, seeing what really is the power in the land. And it is the meandering earth currents that the ancient Chinese would find. It's the spiral patterns. And it's also some very unusual shapes besides, like concentric circles and other uh, types of spirals. They are the ones that the ancients focused on. Modern day people focus on grid lines and lays because they have forgotten what the past was. And we need to remember what the ancients were doing and apply that to our everyday lives. Yeah, this makes so much sense. I know Feng Shui. I'm not a master, but I've certainly spoken to enough people and had it done in my home. And what they have explained is that this is a really good example of what you're saying, but in above ground Feng Shui terms that if somebody, for instance, had a home and the front door of that home was facing where cars drive and the cars would, of course, they'd be going on a road, but visually it looks like the car would go in a straight line right into the house. That's really bad mm. feng shui. So a master would create things to offset all that energy getting impelled upon the home and the front door in order that it is safe, that there are no accidents and that it dissuades that energy because people want a peaceful nest to live in, not so much energy and especially car energy coming at them. So that really makes sense when you talk about the straight lines under the earth and what the Chinese masters did in order to create something way more 
fluid and flowing and peaceful feminine. absolutely and the art of placement mm -hmm. doesn't work unless you know the earth energies of your house when i got taught by chinese geomats you know what they reminded me of italians mama oh. gave them a good pasta sauce recipe and do you think they're going to give every single thing away so they've given me a few top tips yeah <laughs> and so we can uh, blend the art of placement mm -hmm. with what's beneath the ground as well the two should be become one mm. and so as well what the ancient chinese did they would look for the crossing point of those earth currents those mm. powerful male and female yin and yang energy currents and that would be reserved for the emperor's palace or for where the emperor would be buried because it was considered very important to find a burial place as well as somewhere to live again it's not necessarily a western mindset but it makes good sense why because when we go to the Stonehenge environs, they would look for certain energy pa patterns to place their deceased and beloved above. And lo, when we look to how kings and queens were buried in Westminster Abbey of world fame, the same energy patterns is wow. where our kings and queens were buried, just like in the ancient landscape of Stonehenge. So there isn't much difference, really. And when we look at all of this knowledge that has been passed down to us, then we can use it as a key to unlock the potential for our future. Yeah. And th these ley lines, do they have anything to do with extraterrestrials? Where Do they help alien spacecraft to be guided during their visits to Earth? Do they interact? I knew a very famous uh, author, the late Roy Dutton, and Roy Dutton worked for British Aerospace and Rolls-Royce. They're quite prestigious companies uh, in the UK. And what he noticed was in studying east-west flight paths of alleged UFOs that have been documented and north-south pathways of UFOs, they crossed at one particular monument Stonehenge. And he documented that through computer after computer. And it came out that's 99.9% .9 correct. And he wrote a fantastic book called UFOs in Reality. So yes, they can be a magnet, these ancient sites that because it's not just the lays, it's those huge deep aquifers they attract a lot of energy as well why because they interact with the earth's gravitational fields the earth's magnetic field and they can be spotted by those that have you know maybe extraterrestrial uh, craft is not beyond the bounds of possibility mm. and what about vortexes are there ley line vortexes that we should be aware of Oh, far better than that. <laughs> uh, again, if we, if we go beyond the lay, this has been documented since the 1980s and probably maybe uh, 10 years preceding that. So about 50 years of knowledge we have. Mm. And then I've been taught this system. Okay, we've got a vortex, but it's in close proximity to another one. Doesn't have to be so the, the, the same active levels but let's say we've got one over there and one over there one one might be male and one might be female because they are identified that way in the uk and then imagine this energy going round and round and round and it gives birth to an energy current that is now hermaphrodite it's not male and it's not female. And these are hermaphrodite energy currents that go through the land. Oh, they were really sought after by some of our ancient ancestors. Why? They bring us back into balance and harmony within our own male and within our own female. If we want to work with the male and female earth currents, we need a crossing point of that where the male current crosses the female with a hermaphrodite line born of two vortices you have everything in one place and so places like Sedona that I have been to I've been to a lot of ancient sites in America for instance they give birth to these Genesis energy currents and they are powerful and I believe they were used by the indigenous peoples uh, centuries and thousands of years ago as these processional waves the way that you would enter another ancient site, because not far from Sedona, you have an amazing site called Tuzigut 
it means crooked river. And that is very similar in design to a church built by the Knights Templar. They're of contemporary dates as well. And you have a hermaphrodite link in Sedona to Tuzigut. And I think that was a processional way of how to go from one site to another where you have vortex energy. And Mount Shasta, would you also consider this one of those kind of sacred sites that have several of those lines going through it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Mount Shasta is on a world uh, documented map done by Robert Kuhn back in the 1990s. I had the pleasure to attend his workshops as well. And uh, Robert Kuhn has that as one of the very powerful chakra world points. So, for example, you get powerful chakra world points. Mount Shasta is the uh, the base chakra of the planet. And you have Glastonbury, which is the heart chakra and the movable third eye, according to Robert Kuhn's system. And Uluru, uh, Ayers Rock in Australia, is the solar plexus. And Lake Titicaca is the uh, naval uh, center as well. So yes, you can apply all of these different places on a world map, which researchers have done for literally decades now to decode the planet as a whole. And these centers, imagine Mount Shasta or Glastonbury has at this moment in time, according to his hypothesis, it's about 111 miles wide. These places are like massive chakras. <laughs> wow. It makes one want to start traveling even more. I've been to many of these places you're talking about. I have felt this and I'm really sensitive to locations and I don't resonate with many of them. But then sometimes I'll get a, even a thought in my head, like I need to go here. I need to go here. I had that with Shasta for a long time, this compulsion to be in that space. And it makes sense to me now because I also know it's connected to Lemuria and it has other energies that go on there. And I find it very beautiful, very beautiful, very special, lots of UFO sightings there. And that makes sense. I want to go a little bit into the sacred sites because there's so many beautiful places around this planet. We're so fortunate. And I know you have insights about archaeology, about history, and about mysticism of yeah. sacred sites. Can you touch on some of them to give us your insights about this? I think as well, we get overwhelmed by the ancient sites themselves. What's not to love when you look up at the pyramids, when you go to Edfu Temple, when you enter the sanctity of Stonehenge or the world's largest stone circle, which I live nearby, uh, called Avery Henge. But we need as well to remember the people of the past. And because otherwise they're faceless monuments, they are built by the ancestors. And part of my kind of understanding of ancient sites, as well as all of those amazing earth energies, I've opened, I've opened up a doorway to new understandings beyond the grid and beyond the lay to your listeners. But also let's think about the people of the past. Uh, because they were very unusual in their stance. What do I mean by that? I mentioned I discovered the long-headed people of Stonehenge and elsewhere and Brittany and Europe. I could go beyond with uh, my discoveries there. But there's more to them than that because their ear placement was set further back, a bit like the Fae fairy or pixies and also they had smaller faces than what we have they were almost like childlike with a long skull and their bodies were it would have looked a bit out of proportion when an artist or a fashion designer designs clothes they design it because our faces our skulls are one eighth of our body size and that's how artists are taught but the elongated skulled people of Stonehenge and ancient Europe, their skulls were one tenth. So they had long skulls, but a smaller face on a body. So if one was by me now, you do a double take because it would have been like something from sci fi. Maybe this is where the genesis of the Fae uh, came from in some stories in some legends not all of it but just in part so i think when we look back to these people of the past they were the ones that built amazing places like stonehenge 
and other places besides. And then in the history of the ancient world, roundabout orthodox dating by archaeologists, round about 2500 BC, a much taller population came across ancient Europe. They were called officially the beaker culture because they buried their deceased with beakers, but they were very tall, almost giant-like. One at Stonehenge alone was about 13 feet long, according to a 15th century document. So I think woven into the ancient past are the stories of the fae, the pixies, and the giants. They reach out to us from times past, giving us a glimpse into what it was like to live in ancient Britain. And when they lived there, as you describe these two different types and their possible lineage, was the Stonehenge formation rocks still like we see it today or was it different? How do they live amongst Stonehenge and these other sacred places? They lived miles away. So they would go to a place like Stonehenge or Avebury or wherever, but their settlements were a long way away because it's too sacred. If you live above Earth energies for too long, you're either going to get really high if you're happy or you're going to get really low. You need to be a very balanced person to live above these energies. You go to them for healing and other things, and then you come away. For example, Stonehenge looked completely different to the original people that built it. It's been changed over by ancient cultures over a 1,000-year time zone, for example. So I'm going to tell you about one of the, what I think is the most miraculous part of Stonehenge, because I've, I've said on uh, other interviews that I've been on of late, the great thing about Stonehenge, it was documented in the 12th century by Geoffrey of Monmouth, who wrote the history of the kings of Britain. That's where we get Merlin from. That's where we get King Arthur from, from Geoffrey of Monmouth. And if he hadn't written down these ancient myths, he never have heard of Arthur. Mm -hmm. But he did. And he said of Stonehenge, no stone at Stonehenge doth not have healing power, meaning all of the stones were a healing temple, but one stone in particular was miraculous. In my legacy archive, going back to the 1940s and the 1960s, excluding the war years, was a curator. And that curator wrote down some of the strange and mysterious things that were happening at Stonehenge. Trilithon number 51, uh, is a huge, huge stone setting. It's got a, a lintel on the top and it's got two stones. And there were five, allegedly, that went on the inside, in the heart of Stonehenge. And that was surrounded by the lintel stone circle. So what's sp special about this stone? The creator, for more than 25 years, said one thing. It could be a drought. It could be really warm times. And there was a stone, that stone number 51, that you could put your hand in like this because it had a two foot hole, very curious two foot hole that went into the heart of the stone. And in dry summers and near enough every day, that hole would miraculously fill with pure, clean Water. Now it got told by others that this was miraculous water. And if you had eczema, if you had green wounds, that's a kind of cut that's gone a bit festy, then wow, you would get healing energy. And so people came and they queued. And what did the government do then called the Ministry of Works? Because there was no English heritage or anybody that was looking after Stonehenge. They concreted it up. So today we cannot see that healing water. That's just one lost legacy from Stonehenge alone. And in my secret history, I look at all of the, the different stones, but at the heart of Stonehenge is healing because it has a geospiral, that spiral pattern of underground water. It has numerous layers going through it. It has a vortex, an ancient site, a, a power center, doesn't just have lays. It has to have layer after layer after layer after layer. That's your power center. 
that Stonehenge. And when we even go to the pyramids of on the Giza Plateau, they don't just have one energy. They always have a crossing point of lays. They have grids. They have a vortex. They have an aquifer. They have a geospiral. They have earth currents. They have a genesis lay. One thing after another, after another, after another. That makes the power of the land come out. An immense power. That's what people feel when they even approach the ancient sites. Um, some people that are really sensitive, you may be exactly the same. Uh, I am too. You can feel the energy before you even enter the site. It's like going through a wall. Some people describe it as they feel it as like a wall or their hands will start to tingle. But the beauty of these ancient sites, they put us into an altered state of consciousness. As the moment that we go into it, and I, a druid, I would say to people that go to an ancient site, always ask permission, ask the ancestors old, ask the guardian and ask the spirit of place and then you will have such an acceptance from all of time past allowing you to interact with the energies and it only takes a couple of seconds in which to do so oh i love that so much because i'm thinking as you're saying that the last time i went to stonehenge it had changed so much. Now there's a gift shop and you have to walk through and buy a ticket. And there's a, you know, the long walkway and a fence around, not close, but there is a fence around the stone. So anyone who hasn't paid to go see it has to, from a considerable distance, go view it if they should choose. Not many people do. And I wasn't sure if it had changed the vibration and the healing powers and the efficacy of all of why it was created for us now because of all those changes. What are your thoughts on that, Maria? What a wonderful question and such sensitivity about noticing that about the ancient site. So thank you for, for that. Uh, do you know what? There was an ancient site near Avery Henge, the world's largest stone circle, that all of the stones got taken away. And all you have today are concrete marker stones marking where the former stones were. So nothing exists of that ancient site. Not really. But in its etheric being, you can't take the earth energies away. You may be able to take a stone away and make that into building material, which is what they did in 1724 in England. But the energy still stay there. But yes, I mean, when you do put a fence around something, of course, it, it does change it. Stonehenge has always had a fence around it ever since the 1970s. It's just become more prominent now. Yeah, it's uh, more organized and more with a new gift shop uh, and things like that. But at the heart of Stonehenge, you could reach out from afar. You don't have to go to Stonehenge. Some of your listeners, if you're pure of heart and you ask the ancestors, the spirit of place and the guardian of Stonehenge to have energy received into your heart space, for healing, those stones give and they give and they give despite being made ruinous uh, in times gone by, they still give. And that's what I love about ancient sites. They are willing to try and allow our consciousness to grow and evolve through their energetic site. Can you explain also to people, what is a henge? So it, it's just not some yeah. person's name. They name these stones over after stone henge. It actually has considerable meaning and import in this situation and in their placement. So what is it? That's right. A uh, henge means a ditch on the inside. Imagine a ditch on the inside and a big bang on the outside. Now, Stonehenge originally was surrounded by that big bang. That's a henge, a ditch and a bank. And Stonehenge was surrounded by a 10 foot white chalk henge. Why white? You've only got literally, I'm putting my fingers up to the screen. That's as much soil as we've got in the Stonehenge environs. Deep down below that is white chalk. And so all of the ancient sites had white henges in the south of England surrounding them. So back in the day, if I was walking towards Stonehenge, all I could see 
would be the tops of the lintels because there would have been a white chalk bank creating an acoustic wonder on the inside, creating a secretive place as well. A lot of people think they look at them now and see them all open and green and grassed. That wasn't like how the ancestors made them. So imagine a beautiful white circle surrounding Stonehenge and the stone circle on the inside. And I would just like to take this opportunity in talking about colour is that you're looking at Stonehenge and other sites after four and a half thousand years of British weather. It doesn't get much worse than that, Debbie. Uh, and, and so we look at them as, uh, with erosion, but imagine originally Stonehenge, those beautiful sarsen stones, that's what they're called, sarsen, were a silvery, pinkish colour. And you would walk inside of that lintel stone circle, come with me now, and then you'd see smaller stones, highly polished, that were black, flexed with beautiful white flexes like the star-spangled sky, smooth to the touch. They were so highly polished. And now come with me to the holiest of holies, the altar stone that was at the center of Stonehenge. It bejeweled the site. It was green sandstone flexed with red garnet and white mica. It was a sight to behold. We see it today is gray, but back in the time when it was pristine, how colorful, how extraordinary with all of those healing properties of all the different stones, the blue stones, those highly polished ones like the star spangled sky, they came from 150 miles away, tonnage after tonnage after tonnage. And they are three times more magnetic than any other stone in the British Isles. And when you stand by them, they are human height. The others tower above you, they are huge. As you know, you've been there, Debbie, you know that there's some of the stones tower above you, but the blue stones are of healing human height. And what about being a portal? Do they act at all as portals, uh, as stargates? Uh, is there anything related to time travel with these stones anywhere in the world? Sometimes a lot of geomancers, those that study earth energies, think the portals can be outside of the site as much as within. So I'm going to give you an example that was told to me by uh, a serving army officer. You must remember Stonehenge is surrounded by up to 16 military sites. It's not coincidental. Beyond those military sites, we have an area akin to your Area 51 in Nevada because it's no go to civilians. No go, just like Area 51. And two officers, um, they said they were just outside of Stonehenge having a beer, having a, a, a chill out zone, so to speak. And they were looking around and they saw this amber object and felt a little bit kind of dizzy, so to speak, or, or moved around. They went back to their barracks, which is only one and a half miles away from Stonehenge. And they instantly were arrested by the military police for being absent for three days. And they said, but we haven't been absent for three days. We've only just had a can of beer by Stonehenge. And so there have been reports of missing time, but these are trained observers. They, they didn't sense that they had been actually taken away, but they felt something had happened that was inexplicable and extraordinary. So I think sometimes these energies and these portals can be in places where you may not perceive them because they were just outside of the stone circle proper. Mm -hmm. You know, you said that long-skulled people originated from Anatolia, uh, Asia Minor, and possibly traveled across Europe to reach England. Is there a parallel between the long-skulled people, burial practices, the ancient Egyptians, and how in the world do they travel? I don't know if because some of them were fairy-like they flew and actually also had wings, or if you could tell that, or did they actually traipse across the earth to get where they were going? How does this all fit together, Maria? Uh, well, you know, it's a mystery, <laughs> really, uh, because nothing was documented. And some did come down from Iberia 
uh, up from Iberia, Spain as well, and moving down. So there was a lot of movement in the, the ancient world. But what I did notice was, if we look to the burial practices of ancient Egypt in 3100 BC to 2900 BC, you had what was called retainer burials. And it was an honor to, if you were serving the Pharaoh, if you were maybe related to the Pharaoh, and when the Pharaoh died, you would go into the tomb with them. It's called mergence in ancient Celtic uh, druidry. You merge with the land, you merge with the Pharaoh. I mean, we think in our Western practices, oh, that's horrific, but no, it would have been a great honor to become one with the earth. So they had retainer burials in ancient Egypt during that era, and they have exactly the same in ancient Britain. They had what's called these retainer burials, and they, would then become the guardians of the land. And I mentioned the guardians earlier. They merged with the land, an ancient, ancient practice uh, with, with, uh, with the kings and with the queens as well. Oh, my goodness. This is so powerful, this conversation. Um, I want to shift a little bit to women because I think you've been working being interviewed for a series about power women who have been written out of history. I personally am on the shamanic path. I've been trained in shamanism. I'm deeply involved in shamanism. I love the practice for many reasons. And I want to find out, we're talking about Stonehenge, who were the shaman men and women, shaman, shawomen of Stonehenge and elsewhere. Who are these beautiful women who were written out of history? Exactly. When I was looking into the people of the past and the magicians, the high priestesses, the shamans, the kings and the queens, nobody had catalogued where they were buried. That's extraordinary. You're at a World Heritage site. You think that would have been uh, documented? No. So I set to work. And I documented all of those burials and I realized that the high priestesses, and by the way, I'm wearing a necklace, it's identical to a high priestess at Stonehenge. It's a replica of what a high priestess there would, would have worn, it's gold. And the, the shaman and the shah women there, they were buried slightly differently with beautiful artifacts. They probably would have worn these antlers that would have been like a, a headdress, for example, highly polished. They would have worn very fine, silky clothing made of natural material. It's called white nettle. And they would have worn amber breastplates coming down, astonishingly beautiful, astonishing. And they would have worn very fine jewelry as well. And they would have had a particular standardized uh, medical kit uh, containing different crystals, but they were also very highly tattooed because we found ores like these kind of needles that were by little paint pots and they would definitely have residue of skin on them. Okay, so they, we know that they were tattooed and we also know that they wore stretchers in their ears, uh, jet stretchers. And a stretcher is a young people, the Gen Z generation now, Gen Z generation, where the stretchers in their ears. And what I would like to point out is I think these younger people uh, were now, that they reincarnated, as it were, from the people of Stonehenge. Well, I had to just grab something because this is unbelievable what you're saying. You know, there's things I think naturally, organically, we are attracted to. I have some tattoos. Well, that's, you know, a little benign because many people have them these days. But the more I dive into shamanism and the more people, usually people who do readings tell me you have had many past lives. And now you're giving a piece I have never heard before, but I had to grab this and show you <laughs> and show the audience. So I also sing, by the way, we do medicine music, my partner and I, and we sing oh, for shamanic ceremonies and et cetera. And hopefully when we're both in Glastonbury, I can do it as part of my presentation. But I want you to see this. This is something that I would wear on my head that portends branches and flowers. And it literally goes on the head. And this also, 
amazing. And sometimes I will wear these together. This is a piece that it's got, it's all crystals. It's got the moon, it's got stars. And sometimes I wear them together. This also goes in the head. These are phenomenal pieces and they're, they're just otherworldly. They're like uh, being a forest nymph or something <laughs> um, and part animal too. And I just have always loved the energy of these. So yes, these are two pieces that typically I would wear on my head uh, when we sing, especially I could do it when I do shamanic experiences for people. So what a small world that you would mm. mention this about uh, these powerful absolutely. women. Absolutely. I think you're you're really there. You know, you've done it in the past. You're here now. And uh, we love people that uh, bring this uh, forward. So thank you for your work. Uh, and, you know, with the, the people of uh, the past, and you're talking about singing, uh, what I also discovered in my work, which we won't have time to go into today, was that certain earth energies emit certain musical intervals. Yeah. Yeah. And I discovered all of the earth energies and their musical intervals. Now, imagine being at Stonehenge and you with your headdress, you're one of the Shea women there and you're stood. And we are stood side by side, woman to woman, in between the lintel stone circle, the outer stone circle and those blue stones I described earlier. Well, that distance equates mathematically and musically and with the earth energies below to the major third in music. And the major third in music was used by even Christians in their Gothic cathedrals because it raises your emotions and consciousness. Now imagine that coming out of the ground. Musical, the music of Gaia coming out of the ground and you're interacting that and you know, because you're the Shah woman there, where to stand to benefit your consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I think... I think, Debbie, people like you at Stonehenge with your voice and your regalia is mirroring what was happening in the past. And you would be able to sing in particular notes, in particular places, or have the instruments played to those as well. Everything is in synchronized energy. Everything one, everything in sympathetic magic. I think that's the grace of Stonehenge. And that's a memory of yours and a memory of mine going back way, way millennia ago. It's so powerful. My whole energy is getting puddled listening to you. Like there are no words. I'll just say that. And so you are talking, Maria, about these geodetic energies that correspond to healing musical harmonics and they become the music of the earth the music of these sacred sites is there a way to hear them and have you ever heard them would you be able to share what they might sound like well, one site near Stonehenge is called Woodhenge. I don't know if you went there when you were exploring no. the Stonehenge environment. Well, you need a good guide like me, Debbie, to take you there. And uh, and what I discovered there was there's six concentric circles, or there were, of timber posts. You always get a timber uh, circle and a stone circle. They're, they're quite common. And the energies there are musical are the perfect fourth. That's the woman's voice, the voice of the priestess, the Shah woman. So Woodhenge, I think you would so resonate with. And what I discovered there that has never been seen there before, and I believe I'm guided by the ancestors because people say to me, how do you make all of these discoveries, Maria, discovery after discovery? It's because the ancestors want me as a voice. And I think it's the women of time past want me as a voice. So I realized why is there six concentric circles of timber posts? And people normally just walk straight to the center. And that's how a Western mindset works in some people. Let's walk to the center. Then I realize if you walk in a labyrinth, around you go through every single part of that monument and then if that the way you would have walked it is a two and a half coiled labyrinth and guess what that equates to the perfect fall to the woman's voice to the energy coming out of the ground everything even the way you walk it 
is in harmony, in sympathetic magic with the perfect four, which is four over three mathematically. But who needs maths when you've got earth energies and the grace of Gaia and walking in harmony with all of that can be life changing. Oh my gosh. So now I have to ask you, so you do these retreats, you take people around the world. Can you mention some about that? Absolutely. I mean, I've got some uh, in Glastonbury on July the 6th. I'm at Woodhenge working with the energy of the women shaman and the labyrinth energy and earth energies, I think, in June the 6th. But I'm also going to be in America. I'm leading a tour to Charco Canyon, which I've discovered, which was an incredible site. Pueblo Bonito, which was originally maybe even four to five stories high, containing over 800 rooms, and it has amazing earth energies. Remember I mentioned Mary and Michael, the earth currents that entwine? Well, I found at Charco that that great north road is a lay. And entwining that lay, you have wolf energy and deer. You can't call them Christian names. They're wolf and they're deer. And then when I looked, well, when I was researching about Charco, I realized in one uh, ancient indigenous uh, tongue, so to speak, Charco meant hunting ground. Uh, and that's deer and wolf uh, wandering around the area. And I'll also be going to Aztec ruins. That's just north of that. And I'll be there in August the 20. 26th and the 27th, that's on my website, the averyexperience.co.uk. And proceeding that, I'm going to be at Gaia Sphere, Gaia TV, lecturing on ancient civilizations there. And uh, I'll be going to Egypt on September the 6th. Uh, this year and that will also you can click on a link on my website there and next year I'll be going to um, Mexico, Peru and back to Egypt again and ancient America. I will be at America's Stonehenge on May the 3rd next year launching again my uh, secret history of Stonehenge at an ancient site there. So I love ancient America. Last year I was at Charco Canyon uh, and also Cajon. Cahokia. And Cahokia is not far from Illinois. It has its own Woodhenge, like uh, Woodhenge near uh, Stonehenge. And the base of that platform pyramid at Cahokia is near enough exactly the same as the base of the Great Pyramid on the Giza Plateau. It's not as high, but the base of it is absolutely incredible. And that's a very powerful place in ancient America. So um, ancient America is close to, to my heart as well as other sites worldwide. And uh, it's extraordinary to go to these places and to be accepted by the ancestors there. My heart always lies into those that built it. Yes. And you have a new book, is that correct? Can you talk about your new book and where people can find it? Absolutely. My latest book is The Secret History of Stonehenge, which just uh, looks at Stonehenge and the pyramids and many other sites beside. But it's like the lenses are on Stonehenge because I think we've been uh, misled about what it looked like uh, originally. Uh -huh. And so that's a really good book. It explores the musical intervals I've been talking about. I even go into ancient agricultural practices that I think can enhance seeds and enhance growth. And I cover many different things from the long skulled people to the uh, shamans to the high priestesses and far beyond as well. And it's going to be a pleasure talking at uh, various lectures, at conferences this year. Uh, releasing the new information and new discoveries that I've made. Mm. Well, when we go to Glastonbury UK conference, that is specifically towards the end of September. It is called Portal to Ascension. You and I amongst many phenomenal speakers. I think folks now can see the caliber of who's going to be there. And this is Neil Gore's presentation. You know, he does such a great job bringing people together in fabulous places. I want to ask you first, before I ask you what you're going to speak about, are you doing tours while we're there? Are you one of the people as a tour guide? 
No, they they chose some other tour guides, but uh, so they won't be doing the long skulls or musical uh, intervals. But you'll be doing some standard things like you know looking for lays and uh, things like that. Not necessarily the the spirals and things. I think they're focusing on earth currents and, and lane. So no, I won't. Be- okay, well, boo. Um, what are you <laughs> speaking about while we're there? Just, you know, why would be p- people be compelled to come hear you? I know I would be after hearing this. I'll be speaking about uh, revealing the secrets of Stonehenge and other sites. I'll be describing how certain huge monumental structures could emit light. And I've proved that as well with an engineer. I'm going to show you sacred sites like nobody else ever has. And then I'm going to introduce you to the people and the magic and their crystals and their herbs. I'm going to give you 360 degrees of Stonehenge and remembering the people and what they did there and how Stonehenge was not just a healing center, but an oracle of the gods. And may I ask you, right before our final question, Maria, can you just give a brief insight into the shamans and the kind of work they were doing at this location, what you might know about them? Oh, and, uh, well, just there's so much uh, about them to that because I've written a couple of chapters on them. They were the anchor of not just Stonehenge, they were a priestly caste, a shamanic uh, community that traveled to ancient site after ancient site after ancient site, okay? So when we look to the artifacts in the north of England, they are the same uh, people that would travel. So imagine that if you were in uh, reincarnation and you were back then, then you would have been traveling to site after site after site. It wasn't as if they were having their own uh, shamans. They probably did have some localized uh, people there, but the ones that put on the ceremonies, the ones that activated the oracles, the ones that activated the healing, that was the one of their jobs. That was what the shamanic and the, the priest, uh, priesthood were doing. And imagine traveling the lays and the earth currents and going to the heart of the spirals at those centers and leading uh, through sound, through vision, through feeling the stones, their auric fields. That's what they were doing. They were activating the sites. Mm, thank you for the beautiful work you do. And I, I have to say, even in, in researching you and, of course, in this experience with you on the show, I love your presentations. They're so full of you, animated, dramatic. You know, you really pull us in to this very delicious conversation. So right person, right work. Thank you for the beautiful work you do, Maria. Well, thank you. And I want to ask you, this is Dare to Dream. What do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Well, after talking on one podcast, they said, how many countries have you actually doused? And I realized it's about 18 countries I've doused and numerous different uh, sites. So my next Dare to Dream, and I love uh, spinning dreams, Uh, is going to be dousing ancient sites worldwide and releasing secrets after site, after site, after site. I'll be taking you around the world to show you the healing spots, the activation spots, the vortexes at all different places, from Transylvania to Prague to the pyramids to Mexico. I will leave, excuse the pun, no stone unturned (laughs) to show you. The ancient sites of the world. (laughs) Ah, never a boring moment with you, Maria Wheatley. And your (laughs) website, esotericcollege.com. We will also have the Portal to Ascension Glastonbury UK conference in the show notes. So get your tickets. Be sure to sign up now for that. And any other place you want to send them, Maria? Yes, well, uh, if you uh, could go to the Avebury, A-V-E-B-U-R-Y, the AveburyExperience.co.uk. If you can't remember that, just go to my little landing platform that will take you to all of my other sites, MariaWheatley.uk. Thanks, MariaWheatley.uk. 
mariawheatley.uk. Thank you so much for being on the show today. This has been a joy. Thank you, Debbie. It's been marvelous. And I end today's show with this quote from Normandy Ellis. Esoteric philosophy teaches that the physical form, the body of the individual is made new at birth, but the soul is ancient, the stuff of stars. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, your weekly Dare to Dream podcast. If you're listening on one of the major podcast sites and you want to see us and enjoy us there, go and subscribe and leave a comment and like it. YouTube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Next week on the show will be the amazing Lisa Royal Holt. She's a phenomenal channel and she channels one of the greatest extraterrestrials that I've known, Sasha who is a Pleiadian, and we will get into a very deep, phenomenal conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today on Dare to Dream. As always, a pleasure.